Zoom had a bad week, wiping MBRs with COVID-19 malware, and Google pauses a Chrome security update. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morse, and this is ThreatWire for April 7th, 2020. This is your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. On to the news. I know that was a fast one, wasn't it? Man, it has been a week for Zoom. Whew. So this is going to be a roundup of everything that is happening with the collaboration tool that's seen a surge of new users as everyone starts working from home. Last Monday, the FBI posted a public bulletin basically telling folks that teleconferencing services aren't private and secure. This bulletin was in response to the growing surge of Zoom bombing that is happening, which I covered and explained in last week's episode of ThreatWire. The FBI gave similar examples to what I had explained in the show, but they also had some recommendations for businesses and teachers using Zoom. Basically, don't make them public, don't share the link publicly, manage screen sharing options, ensure that users get the updated version, and address physical and information security that is in line with your business or organization. Zoom was hit with a class action lawsuit around the same time this FBI bulletin was posted. As mentioned previously, Zoom was sharing data with Facebook, so a California man filed a class action lawsuit against the company, saying that they had failed to properly safeguard the personal information of the increasingly millions of users. The claim states that Zoom violated the California California Consumer Privacy Act, or CCPA. CCPA requires businesses to tell consumers if they are collecting and sharing data. In response to the growing security concerns around Zoom, the company chose to offer training sessions via their site, as well as free daily webinars to offer users a resource to learn about using Zoom. They announced that over the next 90 days, they are enacting a feature freeze while they shift focus to trust, safety, and privacy issues. Now, Zoom also stated that they would be doing a review with third parties, creating a transparency report, enhancing the bug bounty program that they currently have in place, engaging in penetration tests to address issues, and the founder and CEO would be hosting weekly webinars to provide updates. Now that feature freeze is good timing since several security issues started popping up last week as well. First, the app appeared to be leaking email addresses, photos, and allowing strangers to try to video call users due to an issue in the Zoom company directory setting. It uses email addresses of the same domain to group people together in to a directory. Now this appears to affect users who sign up with non-standard email providers. So if you signed up using Gmail or Yahoo, you would not be affected. Unfortunately though, Zoom chooses to blacklist new domains if they are alerted to this problem. It does not have functionality that would allow you or your domain to opt into the sharing of data, which could save them some work and be more security conscious. Zoom's group chatting feature converts URLs in the chat into hyperlinks for folks to open in a browser, but it also appears to convert Windows Networking Universal Naming Convention Pass, or UNCs, into hyperlinks as well. Now, Windows will try to connect to a UNC path even if it is a file path that is controlled by an attacker. So by default, Windows sends the user login name and credential hash whenever it makes this connection with a server message block or SMB server. Now this can also allow for the host name, the IP address, the domain name, and the username to also be leaked to that attacker. UNC Pass can also launch executables, but this will show a pop-up alert to the user who clicked on that link. Zoom released an updated app to fix this, but users can also restrict outgoing NTLM traffic to remote servers to avoid an attack like this one. Now two more vulnerabilities were also found in the app application. The first one could allow an attacker to escalate their privileges on a machine due to insecure APIs. Apparently the Zoom app is using a deprecated Apple API that should not be used and allows for this to happen. The second one could allow an attacker to gain access to a webcam and microphone thanks to it allowing malicious code to be injected into the app. Now both of these problems were found by a security researcher named Patrick Wardle. While they both require physical access and the user needs to be running the Mac OS client, Zoom did acknowledge both problems and they stated that they are working to fix them. 
And according to a researcher at SecKC, Trent Lowe, several Zoom meetings are not being protected with a password and his tool, which he dubbed ZWarDial, can find the links to these meetings. Zoom assigns meeting IDs between 9 to 11 digits long, and his tool can automate guessing random IDs to find the links to open meetings. Lowe was able to scan for and find 100 meetings an hour using one instance of his tool just one instance. In response, Zoom is now blocking repeated attempts to scan for meeting IDs, and they are also enabling passwords by default. But that's not all. Zoom also had a feature, I'm going to call it a feature, where you could match names and email addresses to LinkedIn profiles using the LinkedIn Sales Navigator, which is a LinkedIn service. So a Zoom participant who might be using a fake name for their own anonymity could be covertly checked out on LinkedIn by other participants via their LinkedIn data. This this was also removed from Zoom's capabilities after reports surfaced. Now, since Zoom saves recorded videos with the same naming conventions each and every single time, unless a user chooses to change that file name, the files could be searchable on the web, assuming a user chose to save it on a server that was publicly accessible, like we have seen happen on Amazon AWS for quite some time. The Washington Post shared details about finding these videos that probably should not have been publicly available. While Zoom could change the naming conventions that it uses for recording, so each one is algorithmically different, users should also be very aware of where they are choosing to save videos and ensure that they are not publicly accessible. Now, lastly, Citizen Lab, which is a research group over at the University of Toronto, they found some issues with Zoom's encryption. Since Zoom uses keys to encrypt audio and video, they looked into how these are encrypted. Zoom servers are mostly located in the US, with five of them located in China. Citizen Lab suggests that because of the location of these servers, Zoom or its employees could be obligated to share encryption keys with Chinese authorities if required. Even if participants are all located in North America, sometimes the encryption keys are generated via those servers across the Pacific. Now, Zoom claims that keys are encrypted using AES-256, but Citizen Lab also found that it's actually AES-128. AES offers modes of encryption as well, including one called Electronic Codebook, or ECB. Now, this is considered the worst type of AES encryption because it leaves traces of the original data. This is also what Zoom uses, go figure. This means that the encryption used by Zoom is not as strong as it could be. Now, I am sure that this is not the last of the Zoom issues that we will hear about, but it's also not the only collaboration tool used that has had security problems. Look at Slack, for example. Zoom should continue to fix these security issues, and researchers should work collaboratively with the company to ensure that their customers are kept safe. This story was chosen by the Threatwire Patreon patrons. The master boot record of a computer tells the PC how partitions are set up on a drive, and it loads the operating system. If it gets corrupted, the machine generally can't boot until it's fixed. For general users, you normally don't want to mess with this. Now, malware has been created themed around COVID-19 that wipes or rewrites that master boot record, or MBR for short. Now, CNET worked with InfoSec professionals to find several different malware strains that were made to wipe or rewrite the master boot record, but none of them were made for monetary gain, which is so odd. Now, the first two could rewrite the MBR sectors and seemed more advanced. One was found by Malware Hunter team, and it goes by the name COVID19.exe. It disables the Windows Task Manager, and it forces a pop-up that will not close, disables the user access control, and it disables options to change the wallpaper. While behind the scenes, the malware is quietly rewriting the MBR, at which time it restarts the PC and the user sees a boot screen saying that the computer has been trashed. This one also adds registry files, which can give it the ability to be persistent. Another one poses as coronavirus ransomware, but the malware was actually stealing passwords while wiping the MBR. This one would rewrite the MBR and add a boot screen saying that the machine was encrypted and demanding pay via Bitcoin. It could also wipe files from the machine, but that ability did not appear to be active, according to researchers. 
The malware was distributed via a website impersonating a cleaning utility, which is called Wise Cleaner. And when downloaded, it would use a file called wshsetup.exe to extract a coronavirus ransomware and a Trojan called Kpot. Now, Kpot will steal cookies and login credentials from browsers, messaging programs, FTP, VPNs, email accounts, Steam, Battle.net, etc., etc. If any cryptocurrency is on the machine, it will also attempt to steal that as well. Now, the ransomware encrypts and changes the names of files with specific extensions, then it demands about $50 in Bitcoin. Researchers suspect that the Bitcoin ransomware is used to actually distract users from the Kpot info stealer, so they recommend using a different machine to reset any passwords that may have been compromised. Now, the last two are data wiping malwares, with one being discovered as early as February. The second wiper was discovered last week. While both of these appear to be full of errors and not as efficient as the rewriting malware, they did succeed. Since each of these different wipers appears to actually work, it is still crucial to practice good security hygiene and not download anything odd from a browser. Before we hit story number three, I wanted to say thank you so much to my supporters over at patreon.com slash threatwire. My Hush Puppy Perk level patrons are awesome for sending in their fur baby photos. We got a new one this week. I love them, keep them coming. And if you want to support Threatwire, but you don't want to be a Patreon supporter, you can check out snubsy.com slash shop to get t-shirts, stickers, even my own digital photography, which I do have some new ones up there this week, all of which supports my show. We can get through this together, and I will continue to bring you security content every single week, so thank you so much to my supporters. I truly appreciate you. Google has a feature called Same Site Cookies that was enabled in Chrome 80 as a beta test for some users, and it would be available later this year for all users of Chrome. Now, this would prevent third-party domains from creating cookies when a user was not actually on their website, so this could actually help prevent those domains from tracking a user as they surf the web. Of course, this does affect advertisers and analytics, but it also affects some online banks, government sites, grocers, and intradents used within companies and a lot more. Now, same site will automatically block third-party cookies unless the website owner approves them, which will protect user privacy a little bit more. If a site uses third-party cookies for logins, blocking them can break the site. We can assume that many essential services have not had time to update their websites for this new feature as they have seen an increase in users depending on online resources. So on Friday, Google announced that they would be temporarily rolling back same site cookie changes made within Chrome in light of the pandemic to ensure that websites that offer these kind of essential services would still be able to operate without seeing issues. The Chrome team is pushing back enforcement of same site cookie usage to the summertime tentatively. Now, before I leave, I want to say thank you so much to Craig, George, Dan, James, Rhea, P. Ramers, Routing Wonk, Norbert, Cyber Ops, and Lady Azcadalia, who joined the Patreon team this week. Thank you so much to each and every one of you. You are all awesome. I really appreciate your support, especially right now. And with that, do not forget to like and subscribe. I'm Shannon Morris, and I will see you on the internet. See you next time. Make sure to stay safe. Thank <laughs> you.